this is a good place to actually move on to some allegations of yes. just how insane the intelligence failure here was because Sagar's absolutely right. I mean, the whole ability of Israelis to live and govern in the manner that they were was predicated on a high level of confidence in the intelligence and in the military. And they that has been shaken to its core. So that's why when you see these reports of like, you got to get three you know days worth of food, there's just no confidence anymore mm -hmm. that the government is going to be able to keep them safe. And this report is another real shocking development, if true, put this up on the screen. Um, Egypt is saying, hey, we warned Netanyahu directly 10 days ago that, quote, something big was going to happen. And, you know, it wasn't extremely specific, but in one of the warnings, Egypt's intelligence minister, General Abbas Kamel, personally called Netanyahu 10 days before this attack said that Gazans were likely to do something unusual, a terrible operation. And according to these um, sources in Egypt, uh, Netanyahu sort of brushed them off and they were fairly stunned that the warnings were not taken more seriously. As we mentioned a few times, they were much more focused on these skirmishes between um, you know, residents of the West Bank and um, Jewish Israeli settlers and the violence that was taking place there. Many of the troops had been redirected there. They said they felt like that was where the real risk was. They thought Gaza was fine, that they were placated. They were given, thinking of giving them a few more thousand uh, work permits, and they thought that would be sufficient to keep things quiet over there. So at least according to this, which I will say, Netanyahu is calling complete yes, fake news and denial. completely denying out of hand. But if this is accurate, I mean, this is another, yet another stunning failure that you actually had information directly from Egypt saying something big is coming and you literally did nothing. Yeah, I think it's stunning too because they specifically say that Netanyahu told the, this is one of those where, look, it's either true or it's not. And it actually should be pretty easy to verify. I personally have a decent amount of trust. The Israeli media, as you can see here, is being incredibly critical of Netanyahu. Both the Times of Israel and Haaretz are out for blood in their response. And they're like, look, we have here an Egyptian official who tells us directly that the intelligence minister, who they name personally, called you 10 before, days before the attack. And the Egyptian officials say that Netanyahu's response, quote, told the minister the military was submerged in troubles in the West Bank directly in his response in that phone call 10 days before. Records are kept. They have the phone call or not. Also, as we all found out during the Trump era, there are contemporary transcripts that are kept on all of this. So if you're in the Israeli government, you should let somebody know. Let's, uh, let one of these grave, uh, great journalists in the Times of Israel, Haaretz, know if that is true or not. What they also point out, though, is that the Egyptian intelligence one of the reasons why they would, of course, have great knowledge is not only do they participate in the blockade, they control one of those major land crossings that Gazans, you know, ostensibly might be able to use. And there's always been allegations that one of the major pathways of weapons into Gaza is through these, you know, Egyptian tunnels of which the Egyptian government either controls or allows or disallows based upon their whims and whatever's good for their domestic situation. So they would have great visibility into what is going Going on inside of Gaza, and this is obviously you know, one of the most authoritarian countries on earth, currently Egypt, under military dictatorship. So I, I personally would have taken this very seriously if something like this were to emerge. So Israelis also should be outraged at this. It also is interesting, um, in terms of the uh, response to the attack, the chief military spokesperson, he said that the army does owe the public an explanation, but he said, now is not the time. Mm -hmm. Quote, first we fight, then we investigate. Uh, yeah, yeah, true. Um, however, you know, it's one of those where a lot of questions still need to be asked here about how this came to be. And as I alluded to, Haaretz, as we, we characterized yesterday, kind of as the New York Times of Israel, continues to highlight some of the major failures of the Netanyahu government that could have led to this. One of these, let's put this up there on the screen, which they put out yesterday. 
quote, an a, a actual quote from Netanyahu openly in March of 2019, anyone who wants to thwart the establishment of a Palestinian state has to support bolstering Hamas and transferring money to Hamas, Netanyahu told the Likud party Knesset members in March of 2019. This is part of our strategy. Uh, and this was actually from a column that was written by an Israeli, Giddy Weitz, and he just said, another concept implodes. Israel can't be managed by a criminal defendant. Quote, a direct line now runs between judicial overhaul and the Gaza war. Netanyahu should ameliorate Begin and go. We cannot expect introspection from him. The future inquiry must investigate how much time the prime minister has devoted to reform and how much listening to the military leadership. And they specifically highlight his political strategy about how to come back to power, tearing the country apart by basically, he's, he really is a lot like Trump, uh, except it's smarter in my opinion. He basically is in it for survival willing to do whatever it takes mm -hmm. to remain in power, doesn't care about democratic norms or any of this, will ally himself with anyone as long as they are on his side. And the political expediency and all of that ripped the country apart, not only domestically, but their intelligence community. And it's within that vacuum of chaos that this attack happened. And now Israel finds itself in a battle that they have not faced in 50 years well, as a and, country. And that's yeah. the immediate context, which is really yeah. important to understand understand that because Netanyahu was in trouble for his own allegations of corruption, yeah. which he denies, um, that was the genesis of this fight to basically kneecap the um, independent judiciary and Supreme Court. And that's what created this mass conflict and these protests. And that's what, you know, and also that's part of why his quest for power is part of why he ended up forming this coalition mm -hmm. with these effectively like racist psychopaths on the, the hard extreme um, part of the Israeli spectrum. And they're the ones who were so intent on pushing forward with the um, illegal settlements and protecting these Jewish settlers over and above, making sure that the Gaza border was safe. So that part is really important in terms of the micro context. But that quote that we just had up there really speaks to the macro context here too. As we said before, you know, in the West, we sort of maintain this fiction because we're far away and we can do it, that, oh, there are you know, two state solution and there's a path to that and that's what we need to be pushing for. That's not what Netanyahu wants or believes. Um, he is very clear in this statement that he wants to thwart the establishment of any Palestinian state. And the way to do that in his view, and this goes back also to the founding of Hamas, which was bolstered by uh, Israelis in order to be a check on the PLO, his view continued to be, hey, if you wanna thwart the establishment, what you should do is build up Hamas. Why? Because it's going to be very unsympathetic if you have these psychopathic terrorists who are the face of the Palestinian um, liberation movement. It's going to be very unsympathetic, the idea of giving them any sort of a state. So let's build them up. That's the way to go in order to make sure that we you know, are able to sort of short circuit any talk of a real peace solution, two state solution or otherwise. And that's been the direction that um, you know Israeli public policy has been going in. And at this point, it's really not even just um, Netanyahu and, and the hard right. This has become the status quo in Israel, where it's like, you know, we think that the IDF is going to keep us safe. We think the intelligence is so great that we're not going to suffer any real threats. We can just sort of maintain the occupation and the blockade status quo and put the Palestinians out of our mind. And globally, this was the position adopted by the U.S. internationally of, okay, under Trump, we're going to do the Abraham Accords and just pretend like the Palestinians don't exist. Under Biden, we're going to do this new Saudi the Arabia deal, which is very similar, and just pretend the Palestinians don't exist. That was the idea of how are they going to build this quote unquote new Middle East. And I think it really comes through in this quote how much of a failure that policy is. And the fact that you are never going to have, I don't care how many millions, billions, trillions of dollars you spend on your military and the high tech and the surveillance and all of that, if you really care about safety and security, for your own citizens, for Israeli citizens, there will be no real safety and security until you have a some sort of a just and sustainable resolution to the, you know, 
the apartheid conditions that Palestinians are currently living under, both in the West Bank and in Gaza. Yeah, well, I uh, hope that we eventually get to that, you know, in this situation. But unfortunately, I just think so. There's going to be so much death and destruction in the in the middle. Um, and it's already happening. It is already happening, and as I said, it, it really can only get so much worse from here, especially if we see a full bone war break out. And we don't even see any attempts really at diplomacy or any of that, which I understand, you know, in some cases on the Israeli, and even on the Palestinian side, they both feel like they're so all in at this point that they've got nothing else. The amount of dehumanization do. that has happened here, I mean, is just, it's yeah. just- I mean, you heard the Hamas guy, he's like, you know, he's like, it's unfortunate, but we're gonna cut these people's heads off, you know, on camera. And uh, well, see I mean, they had no qualms about yeah. murdering any Israeli they saw. Yeah, exactly. They're and like then, shooting up little grandmas and, and, and you know, sm even children. And then same thing, you know, I see the same, I see videos of little tiny kids and babies getting pulled out of Gaza wreckage. And you're like, man, this is just, it's so, so horrific. Yeah, really absolutely. Uh, you know, attacks on markets, attacks yeah. on mosques, raising apartment buildings to the ground. Again, half of Gaza, children. Um, median age of 19 years old. These babies are not Hamas, they are not terrorists, and they deserve life as much as, as these precious Israeli babies do as well. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber, and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right, we're subscriber funded, we're building something new, we wanna replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.